Hello, it's Dave Herman, alias Daz the Artist, and it's time for me to draw tonight. So this will be, a, I believe, we're into like the fourth session of this one. I won't show it all the way through, but in the beginning it's kind of cool to show stuff, and then as it really progresses we'll get into it again. So um, this is the century, in case you've been following. And uh, let's go to work. So first thing I'm going to do is enlarge my file here. Excuse me, I had a nice bike ride today, cooked up some nice volcano rice, which is um, three different rices you can buy from Indonesia. I get an 11-pound bag through a website called Lotus Foods. So if you're kind of a like to cook hippie meals and make healthy food for yourself, uh, you might try those guys. I got some uh, rice crackers and uh, some good rice from them. So after my bike ride, I really cooked up a nice little meal. All right, let's work on the right half of this. So looking at that, I see a lot of different things than I see on the left half, which kind of has a retro look, like almost like a car grill or remind you of a diner or something like that, you know. Uh, so we'll see what I do on the right. Finished up a nice sip of some fruit juice. Okay. Let's see here. So I'm going to enlarge this even more. I, I see this a lot of different ways, but what I'm really seeing is a horizontal bar casting a shadow. Even though it's a line, I can envision it being a shadow. So here's what we're going to do. We'll make a new layer. Um... So go to my top layer here, pop over that, and let's give that a name, call that uh, right lung retouching just for now. Make sure it touches off on my tablet. There we go. So I'm going to go to work. So first I'm going to get some uh, some white. And let's do some of that uh, popcorn effect. We're going to go into the Pixel Persona in Affinity Designer and hit brush. And uh, start to work up the other side. I'm going to teach you some of my... Or, not teach you, but reveal to you some of the ways I do things. So first I'm looking at this this thing here in the middle. Now watch how I change my doodle into a solid object that casts a shadow and uh, is pulled away from the other stuff old school airbrushing way. Alright, so I got that going. So I'm going to go into the darker purple. Actually even with some uh, hmm. I'm liking the brown. So let's go to brown for this. I think I got a rich brown shadow and that's going to come down here but follow the surface a little bit. And then get a little wider right in here. Scoop under just a little on that edge of the object. And then you have to have some under lighting, um, in my opinion, to make that lift. So we're going to first color the shape. See, we're brightening it up right there, and uh, just watch me move around that triangle a little bit and change the brush shape with my Express Key Remote on the Wacom 24 Inch Pro, where I do all my art. All my digital art is on that device in a little uh, scrappy laptop. 
<laughs> I have modified my stuff and monkeyed around with it all, so don't try it at home. I mean, it's just when you're desperate, you do desperate things. However, I've got it all working. If you never followed any of my videos, I work off of a 17-inch uh, Asus G750JM Gamer tablet, uh, tablet, uh, laptop that I bought seven years ago, the original owner, and uh, those come with eight gigs of RAM and. Um, I upped it to 24. I put in another 16 gigs myself, two 8 gig cards. And then I hooked it up to a Wacom Intuos, no, a Wacom 24 inch Pro monitor with touch on an ergonomic arm. And uh, I have one on a standing desk, so if I'm in the mood to stand or I'm in the mood to sit, it's up to me. And uh, we're trying to get the lift here and separation. And that's kind of my setup. I sit more than I stand, but I should stand. So when I when I don't stand enough, then I go out for a bike ride. <laughs> it's another way I punish myself, make myself go out and do something. So today was a good bike ride, nice little 15 miler. Came back, cooked a little brown rice, ate some, uh, what do you call them, uh, rice crackers, and tasty little meal. Threw some salsa in my rice. Uh, cooked up what was called volcano rice. I ordered this tri blend of a short grain rice, brown and red rice, from a place called Lotus Foods on the internet. Just found it, you know. About a year ago, I've been getting stuff from those guys occasionally. One of my sources of the many things I get in life. Keep my life interesting. I'm a solo guy. I don't want to get bored. And uh, so the try, the try rice. It's brown and red rices mixed together. You can get a nice 11-pound bag from those guys. I was going to go for the 24-pound, 25-pounder. But they're sold out. I mean, during this crisis, everybody's getting sold out of stuff. So if you're an old hippie like myself and you like things like brown rice and bulk foods and kind of co-op-y stuff, but I don't like going into co-op, so I just buy off the Internet. Um, Lotus Foods has some good stuff. They make some ramens and they make uh, crackers and they make all kinds of things. When I buy ramens, I usually throw away the extra ingredient little bag they give you. All I use it for is the noodles <clears throat> and the water that I put in with my sink. But then I add my own spices and chop up stuff myself when I make ramen. So I'll chop up anything from radishes, onions, garlic, bok choy, uh, you know, whatever you want to put in your little ramen which I make like a little soup sometimes I'll make up my own lava eggs you know it's like a hard boiled eggs but you don't cook them as long so the middle's a little bit soft they call that a, a lava egg those are pretty good make my own way. so yeah you know like I say a solo life I like to cook it's one of my many things I do did a little gardening today, getting my fig tree pruned up and bent up and tied up in shape for it to start to bear fruit pretty soon. Looking for that. You know, it happens in the next two months. It'll take for it to start to get fruit. But is that time of year? So gardening, bike ride, cook a meal, draw at night, keep in touch, do my email stuff, do my business stuff, even though there's no business, can't work as a tattoo artist during the crisis, and nobody in their right mind would be open with the plague. So you've got to be self-disciplined and keep yourself occupied. 
especially, you know, you sit in the house a lot. Uh, it's typical to do that, but there's somehow when you're forced to do it, you think of it as more of a, you know, a trap. And uh, I don't really socialize a whole lot outside of my customers. So it's not like I'm really being hurt much that way. It's just the thought of you really can't just meander around. You gotta be very careful. So doing my best. Spending the time alone at the property. Another thing I've been doing that's been a bonus while this is going on is I started getting back into my Tai Chi in a heavy way. So today was the fourth day in the morning that I went out. It's right around 10 o'clock. I'll get out there and do my Tai Chi set in the morning. So I still recall the uh, 108 move set, Yang style, Tai Chi Schwan. And uh, I do that in the morning. And uh, many things I cram into a day. It's one of those kind of guys. Did not get my nap in today, which is usually like to have a little nap somewhere out in the sun. You know, I'll sit in the sun for 45 minutes to an hour just to get my D. And uh, a little tiny headset on, just those earbuds, you know sit in my lawn chair, have my music on my phone, and just kind of nod out, get to a Z at some point in the day when the sun's nice and bright. I do that for a number of reasons, especially during a plague. When you have a virus like this, the sun, being a tattoo artist, I can tell you, is a sterilizing agent. You know, UV, ultraviolet light, sterilizes. They make little lamps you can buy. I own one. Many people own them in the tattoo biz that you pass over your tattoo machines for a little sterilization. But if you're outside, it's sterilizing your clothes and stuff on. You, you do a nice bake out there in your nap time. A lot of people worried about cancer, so, you know, do whatever works for you. But I usually uh, push up my sleeves so that my forearms, my hands, and I push up the pants so that the calf area and the feet get a little sun it's also good if you don't want you know toe fungus or something like that <laughs> sun is a sterilizer if you have that it will probably help cure a lot of it if you put your feet out in the sun and without the gas these days and the pollution the air is a lot fresher the birds are singing a lot more and the uv is getting through that's for sure so that's if you notice around your house, you would not see as much mold growing or moss or green stuff up the side of your house, in the northwest especially where I live. And uh, there's still those spores that come out of the trees and molds and stuff at this time of year, so our car is usually covered with green dust <laughs> in the summer. I, I, I don't get it. You know, it's just a, a jungle here. The city, but at once it was a rainforest, you know. So there's weird stuff that happens in the Northwest. I'm in the state of Washington, Olympia, Washington. If you want to look it up on a map, towards the coast, but not all the way. It's south. It's downward in the state. It's not north. Olympia, Washington is near three little bodies of water, some inlets. I'm uh, four blocks from what's called the Bud Inlet. And occasionally, maybe three times in the summer, I'll throw my kayak up on the car, drive eight miles, launch it into what's called Boston Harbor. Believe it or not, on the West Coast, there's a Boston Harbor. And I'll launch it from there and then paddle for a good three, four hours and come back. Another good exercise. If I lived on water, I would be in every day with a rowboat or a kayak. The times I did live in, on water, I definitely did that as part of my regime of working out. It's nothing like a rowing machine. It's way better to have a rowboat, a kayak, or a 
paddle board or something like that, you know. And if you're on water, then it's easy because you don't have to load up your car and your gear and get lunch and think about all that stuff. See what you're going to forget at the beach and all that stuff. You just have it at your house and you jump in the lawn and come back to the house and leave it laying on the lawn, you know. That's the life where you can do that. I don't think I'll ever see that again, but I liked it. I did it in Michigan for many years. I was a younger businessman. Alrighty, so we got this going on here. So now this, this almost looks like a face in profile, like a big green nose, some blue lips, a cheek. I can see stuff in there. I like to have the art show stuff. Now, let me do a save. And so we've only drawn for 15 minutes, but watch. I, on the right-hand side where I have my layers, I'm going to turn off that top layer we just did. And you see how it looked? And now if I turn that on, you see how I've enhanced, given it depth and things like that? Mm -hmm. Love messing with color, form, line. So... My thought process, again, in a nutshell, first you have a sketch. My sketch I do without any preconceived notions. We call it free association uh, or freestyle from where I come from. But it was free associating when we were kids and became freestyle as adults. Detroit squid. So I just sketch, you know. Then I look at the line, and my line I want to make either thick or thin to have value. We call it having value. If it's the same thickness like in mathematics when you're connecting point A to point B where your line is a uniform thickness, that's for the math, but or super precise, you know, mechanical drawing or something. But when you're doing a fine art like this, uh, what I call fine art anyways, my line has value. I like it to go from thick to thin to flat to curved to whatever. And uh, so I start out with a sketch. I change the width of the lines. I use lines to define form. And then, you know, like the outline of, a say, a, a thimble. You know, you'd have your shape. And then... Shading to make things recede or come towards me. And color for the same reason. But when I do it, I want the colors to be vibrant and lively. So a lot of thought goes into my choice of colors. And that's very convenient to have these color wheels next to you or color blocks. or Because you can really just envision stuff out of the 16 million colors it's uh, possible to make from zero to 100% in each of the four colors, CMYK, cyan, magenta, yellow, and black, you have 0 to 100% of each of those, and then all the combinations come out to 16 million colors. But all you have to do is just touch a point in the triangle, and there you go. You don't have to get out paint and mix it. Uh, again, my the feel of my stuff is mixed media. So... I have taken my mixed media skills as a traditional artist and in the last seven years of teaching myself digital art, figured out ways to, to do that uh, visually, digitally. And I just love digital art now. I would never go back. Honestly, would never go back. But I can't afford to output my stuff. I can't afford to have things laying around for customers to look at or anything. Uh, it's very pricey to take these to canvas and stuff. So, there's a few you can look at on my digital porthole at ArtStation. I have them up there for sale if you're interested. I can do a custom one if you want. You can hire me for a commission. I'm available. Especially with this uh, coronavirus thing going on, I'm not tattooing anymore right now. And I'm um, you know, trying to figure out ways to generate income. 
So I've taken some time to enter a few contests, get, see if I can get myself published, which I never really went for digitally. I just practiced. But I think I'm there now where I can start to build a career. So I'm starting to do that too during the day, finding places that uh, I have a chance of winning money or maybe a grant or something. I'm just, just beginning to start learning about that all. But I sent off uh, four of them this week to be published and one to be in a contest to try and win $10,000 as a magazine cover or something. So I did sci-fi. Let's we'll see what happens. Got to, you know, art is a self-discipline, and I, I did it my whole life. I raised a family being an artist, uh, but it was in the printing industry, lithography. And I've done stained glass. I've done um, tattooing for 21 years, advertising for 20 years, and now uh, digital art, seven years of teaching myself. I have my own unique style I'm proud of and starting to get into the very fine details of it all, the way I think. Uh, and it's starting to gel more, you know. The whole thing is you've got to draw. That's what everyone tells you, just you've got to draw. I think the biggest, the biggest push I had to do to myself was a daily sketch and I did that in the year 2018. Made myself do at least one digital sketch a day, sometimes up to three, um, anywhere from you know 10 minutes to hour or two. And sometimes if I did none I would do three on a different day or whatever. But by the end of the year I had more daily sketches than there were days in the year and that was the point so uh, in that year I tried to draw and copy um, everything from microscopic to macrocosmic so I did animal vegetable mineral plant um, and then fantasy and then chrome and, and, you know everything I really did I Having been a traditional artist, I forced myself to uh, think about a lot of stuff. It's very hard to make the transition mentally and uh, the talent of your changing your anatomy to work on digitally. Because when I first did this, I just worked on an Intuos Pro tablet, which doesn't have a monitor. So I used my head looking straight at the monitor while my hand was perpendicular to a flat table drawing on a tablet, but I didn't look at the tablet, I looked only at the screen. Then when I made the transition to this glass, you know, that I can draw right on, that was really difficult for me. I just, you know, looking at the screen, looking at the glass, looking at the cursor, it was very, very confusing for me. But I made myself go f further and uh, by forcing myself to draw daily uh, things once I got the handle of it. The, the biggest change for me though in a positive way was getting Affinity Designer and those for some reason I was just looking at the internet and I saw people drawing on Macs with the Affinity Designer Suite. And they said, boy, that software looks freaking interesting to me. So I, I have a Windows. I've always been a Windows guy. And I thought, okay, I'll get the version for Windows. Well, drawing on a... Intuos Pro was tough, so I, I made the plunge uh, to get the... Wacom 24 inch Pro and I have not regretted this. It's the greatest art decision in my entire life was to go for the Wacom. You know when you watch the reviews on the internet and I'm not a spokesman for Wacom or anybody 
I'll just tell you things I like and don't like because I'm just one of those guys. I'm not shy. I tell you how it works for me, what doesn't work for me. And then you make your own decisions for you. But the Wacom, because I live in the state of Washington, I'm close enough to Portland, Oregon. It's like an hour and a half. And Portland, Oregon has the only place in the world where you can test drive Wacom products. And that's the Wacom Experience Center in Portland, Oregon. So if you have the opportunity to go there, they allow you to bring in your laptop or your desktop, plug it in, and try the products. Because everyone has different software, right? So they can't own all the various softwares. You go in, you sit down, you try to, you know, whatever your favorite program is, Photoshop, Affinity Designer, uh, Click Paint Studio, whatever. Uh, you have to have the software. So you bring in your actual device and just plug it in. I tried everything they had, <laughs> and I would have bought the 32-inch if I had the kind of money. But now that I've been using the 24, I don't think I really need a 32. 32 is bigger. You know, you can draw bigger and all that stuff, but man, it takes up too much real estate in your studio. Unless you've got a big studio. I live in a very small house. So my living room, dining room, kitchen is one room that's 18 by 22. And in that is where I cook, I eat, I nap, and I draw. <laughs> It's like being in a big bowl. <laughs> Wouldn't have it any other way now that I've done it. So, very content with my little pad. And uh, as you can see, I've. You gotta mix up your day. I, I just wanna say that. So, you don't wanna just sit there and draw and draw and draw and draw, unless you're that kind of person, because it just gets monotonous, or you're gonna get a kink in your neck or whatever. So you got to exercise, do a little gardening, do a little cooking, do a little walking, do a little hiking, whatever you can afford to do, whatever you have time to do. But don't just sit at your monitor all day. Make sure you draw every day. You know, that's how you're going to develop your talent. It's the only way you're going to get talent. You're not going to talk yourself into talent. you got to draw. I'm doing all this with one brush, you know. But you develop little tricks digitally that you wouldn't, uh, you know, have if you've done mixed media work. So I was a traditional artist. I, I sold many paintings in my lifetime. And uh, so I worked in oil. I worked in Conti crayon. I worked in chalk. I worked in gouache. I worked in airbrush. Uh, I love Conti Crayon, which is a dry pastel stick, and I love airbrush, and I love gouache. So I airbrushed with gouache, and I played around with pencils and charcoal and all that, you know. I have a two-year degree in uh, finer, you know, it was just a liberal arts, but it was a focus on figurative drawing when I went to college. Served a four-year apprenticeship in lithography, was an advertising exec, been tattoo artist for 21 years, and did stained glass. So the more you build your kit bag, which just happens out of necessity, you know, you get laid off or you lose your job or you can't find a job, so you reinvent yourself, you become something else, you you just say, well, you know, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna become a stained glass artist. That's it. I'm just gonna buy the shit. I'm gonna sit in my garage or sit in my extra bedroom in the house or whatever, and I'm gonna learn how to do this. Well, nowadays people have the internet, so you don't have to pay for all these classes. You just type in, you know, I want to learn how to do stained glass. How would I solder, you know? Uh, two pieces of lead came together with the glass in the middle. It's all on the internet. Uh, you, millions of tutorials for free. Millions and millions of things. I've definitely gone there to learn how to do my digital art. You know, like I'll type in even today. 
because nobody knows all these tools, I'll say, okay, how can I do a distortion in Affinity Designer, for example? And they say, well, there's no work tools. You need to have Affinity Photo. And then you can take your Affinity Designer file into Affinity Photo and apply to work. So then you go, oh, well, wonder I can't do it. I need another piece of software. So yeah, the internet's really great for that. When you did it on your own, before there was the internet, wow, the amount of money, time, and energy you spent to learn things was incredible. But now I can just type it in and get an answer up instantaneously. You know, within a half hour, I can drill anything down, repair a car, fix a washing machine, whatever has to be done. See how we're getting these super cool edges and stuff. So let me say this, and we're going to pan back. We're only 30 minutes into this. Watch this change. I'm going to hit, turn off the layer. See how that soft focus, and then poof, becomes reality. So let's view this guy. Uh, zoom to fit. And there he is on the screen, the sentry. Now let's take the magnifying tool. And put that in the center of the chest and just start to enlarge. Kind of like that. So while they're in the lung area, they look like faces, they look like many things. I try and make them vague and I try and also enhance them to all this organic material. And then the whole thing looks like it could be two large green eyes with a mouth in the middle and so I have, you know, this modern art sculpture, and it looks cubist, and a lot of things going on, African statues maybe with the mouth with blue piping at the bottom, or fingers, or a lot of stuff going on. You need to have drawing for lots of years to have a mind full of that stuff, or a photographic memory, which I don't have. So people that have photographic memories, just, they're lucky. Okay. So now we have this really just super cool asymmetrical creature. Hmm, pardon my yawning. Just loving that. So now we're going to go view at 100% and see what it, at my output size. This is a 24 by 24 inch, 300 DPI canvas I set up. So if we go 100. That's the actual output size. Mm, man, it's just, it's coming together. That's what I'm saying, dog. Super cool. All right, let's go down here where the teal is like an apron of copper with some teal geometry stuff happening. Let's get the hand, move this up a little, and enlarge this a little. So, we'll work down there. See, it looks like this teal objects are casting shadows. So, let's enhance that and keep that in shadow area. Wow. Man, sometimes I come back from a bike ride, I'm ready to rock. Of course, it's been a long day, long, long, long day. And I'm glad I didn't take my nap, because that way I'll sleep like a baby. Eventually. Okay, now down here... Got all this weird, nondescript uh, stuff casting shadows. I like to keep it vague, but just <laughs> define some forms a little bit. So what I'm doing is to make things come at me. I use light colors to make them recede. I use dark colors. 
but I use them in the proper way off the color wheel. So what that means is, you know, here, RGB, red, green, yellow is, I mean, red, green, and blue, that's your uh, video type colors, and if you're using uh, regular paint and stuff, it's CMYK, you know, so uh, red, blue, and yellow are your primaries. So if you look at that triangle, you got red, blue, and yellow, and then your secondary colors are the ones that they make. So red and yellow make orange, yellow and blue make green, blue and red make purple. And that's your secondary colors. And then all the transitions in between give you that wheel, the rainbow, right? So it goes yellow, green, blue, purple, fuchsia, red, or rose tyrene, red orange, you know, you get that wheel. Inside the wheel is a triangle, or you can use a square. So say we click this color at the top in that little dot, and then the square appears. That can be a color chooser. And uh, if you think of the bottom as a solid black bar, 100% black, and that by the time it gets to the top where it's 100% white, it's dropping off a percentage, 99, 98, 97, 96, and so on, down to zero. And then think of your green, your teal here, as 100% going from uh, right to left, solid, and the other one's going from uh, the lower right corner to the upper left, and one's going from the lower right corner to the upper right. You know what I mean? So, like, the black is starting in the lower left corner, 100%, and then it's going towards the upper right corner. So you have 100% black to zero, and then the teal is in the lower right going up to the upper left, and they cross, and you get this kind of a picture. Then you can pick any number of color you want, and you know, if you're rainbow bar that comes out of a prism, it changes the square, or it changes that triangle, and then you also have that circle. So lots of ways you can play with color. And... Uh, you know, utilize your tool. So if you look in the center, I have that nice soft feathered edge around the bottom of that, like a lip, ellipse kind of a center. And let's uh, define all that a little bit. It's kind of a vague and sloppy looking, and it's not my fave right now. So I'm going to put a little red in here. That interior on that side, kind of bring it down, put a uh, touch of fuchsia on the other side, so it warms up that middle. Then I'm going to give that like a glass look. So, how do I do that? Well, I'm going to take some white and go to the blue, teal, like that. Use a white that's Partially, it's 100% white, but it comes from the teal palette. And I'm going to uh, put a soft edge down the side. Then I'm going to go big in the middle and run it right down the center, hard, like that. And smaller in the brush, go up higher, come down, like that. Now I'm going to put a popcorn or a bright spot right about where that teal bar is in the center, the below center, mid bar. So you see where the teal rises up like it's in a thermometer. There's only one third of it is teal at the bottom. I put that hot spot. I kept this irregular. I'm going to um, put a little crispy spot right there on the edge. 
And that looks much better. I'm going to save that. Yeah, let's see, we're 40 minutes into this. So we've got another 20 minutes, and we got a lot going on, which is very cool. All right. Let me scope this out. I'm going to put some black in there. So I like rich blacks, and I'll go to my purples for that. And select the black in there where there's a lot of blue and red and black all together. So it isn't just black by itself, which is a little bit flat. You have those other pigments in it, and it gives it a richness. It's what we call a rich black. Rich black is black with other colors in it. Mostly red and blues to darken it, but it has a look of depth, and it isn't flat like a matte black, something like that. Mm -hmm. I can flatten these sides away just a little bit with some black so that the middle object protrudes. Then I'll put some popcorns in the bottom or some highlights so we'll get some white and we'll kind of go around the bottom just like that and the opposite side at the top we'll do like that so we'll kind of come down a little further like that feather in it's a little raw which is you know the edge is a little raw for me so I'll kind of Smooth out the edge because I want that edge just smoother. It just feels better. With not any logic, it just feels better to me how I look at it. And I'll put some highlights here and there just to uh, you know, just to do it. So you kind of suggest an object that you think you're seeing that isn't really defined. Uh, don't run things. So when you add a hot spot, you don't just rub it. You start and go up, and then you go to the back of that same spot and go down, and then you get that hot spot you like in a smooth up and down movement. We'll put a bright color in there, some orange on the outside of this edge. Right there. Just highlight it up there. And then I'll take and put a touch of red, reddish orange inside. Like that. Kind of messing with it now. Okay, now I'm going to put the white edge on there for the glass look, the shiny, slick, we don't know what's the enclosure, but it's something that could be transparent, gives you that sense of transparency. Some things like sensual shapes. Uh, it's always good to do that, to tie it into something organic in nature, even though we're drawing an uh, alien, organic uh, combination of hardware, software, organics, mechanical, uh, self-regenerating, whatever thing, entity. It's created by a higher life form than us, what I would call the type 3 civilization. So, look up type 1, type 2, and type 3 civilizations if you're a science fiction person. By all means. Okay. And, uh, it was coined by a Russian scientist in 1964 or 5. The type one, the type two, and the type three civilization. Kind of chef or something like that. But they will be enlightening to you. Be very, very enlightening. Mm -hmm.
All right. Only 15 minutes of this and we're good. Yes. Uh, hmm. Quite African looking and retro looking and modern and lots of challenges. Let's put that close this box. And let's take Mr. Hand and move this around a little bit and see what we got there. So there's the guy's head, the sentry. Looks like a little black sticking off his head there. See that? Let's uh, let's get rid of that. Let's find out where that is. So if we go to uh, first group up and take the eraser, just kind of erase. See if it's on that layer. It doesn't appear to be. So we'll go to the next layer up. And there it is, see? You can clean that by moving the eraser around. See if we got another debris. Yeah. Art's like a uh, really crazy, uh, if you're eccentric like myself, and you don't want to whack out about sometimes your smudges. <laughs> Smudgy! Okay, save. Let's do uh, uh, shrink him a little bit. So let's see what we got. We'll move him over. Keep him center screen. And we'll bring him up again. Uh. So there's that kind of from the head down to the bottom of the tarsus or the insect type mechanical hands. And. Uh, Hmm, where to go next? That's a good question. I think we'll start on the right-hand side, and we'll start to develop the arm, and I'll go back and forth and kind of think about that. I'm going to keep all this in view. Let's see how big it would be at actual. I like to work at least at actual. Okay. See, all those sketch lines are kind of cool. Yeah, we're thinking. Okay, so all this shoulder stuff that's compacted stub stuff on the diagonal looking like a triangle around something and then, you know, just unfolding into an arm. I'm going to give some definition to that stuff now. So I'm going to put my color wheel back on here. Uh, hmm. You do that by yeah. See? This little thing over here. You click that. Gives you a choice between sliders, boxes, tints. Um, you know, so sliders look like that. You can go boxes like that. Tint like that, and then uh, we're going with the wheel. And then the wheel, so you pick a color, so you pick that color, that circle changes, you tap that circle, and you get the box. Toy maker, give me the box. All right. Okay, let's start in the upper right hand side of the face. You're going to start by a lightning. I'm going to make another layer here. So you tap your top layer and then you come down here next to the trash can to the left and you get a layer. And then we're going to call this uh, right shoulder. Thing you want, but it's just so I know, have some kind of reference. 
Okay, let's start at the very top there. Uh, be in brush, and away we go. So we're oh, that in my car, fuchsia. Yeah. Here we go. See up near the face where I'm drawing. Go brighter, just play around inside that box, which becomes your palette. Like if you had mixed up paint and put it on a piece of plastic, you know, and you're going to pick it from with your brush. Beauty of digital is you just click anywhere and you got the color in a second. I mean, a second. Just a second. Super sweet. And you're thinking to yourself how your overall mood's going to be. So if I do this little thing left to the right of the face, and then I'm thinking maybe I'm going to put a little pop corner on it just for now. I'm going to put a little highlight somewhere. And then an arch. Now it looks kind of like glassiest. Glasses. <laughs> I don't know. I made up the word. It's like it's like glass looking, right? Now, if you do just the white, you see how cold that looks. So you could go to the next color. It would be warmer with a red or an orange, like that. You could do that, and then you go into yellow, and you're using actually pigment to show closeness of firmness. Just, you know, it works. All kinds of ways to do it. So now I have that piece. I might connect that piece with some wires. Goopy wires. This stuff. Mm-hmm. I come down to the next piece. Back to my fuchsia. Take some dark with the shadow edge. Delineates. And I'm gonna start jumping around and working so you can watch me. This is just my gut doing this. Gut reaction. You know? Just what I feel. Just how I feel it. Sometimes there's logic involved, you know. I'll look at it and I'll say, okay, this needs to come closer to me. Something needs to be further away. But also, I like to have the textural feel of whatever the mood is I'm creating in this uh, painting by color, shape, form, and uh, degree of refinement or lack of refinement. doesn't hurt to have a bunch of color uh, if you're trying to create a mood where things are metamorphosizing, if they're changing from one thing into another. One thing into another. Yeah. I'm going to put some dark energy in there. Dark matter, dark forces. Spaces in between things are good when you're doing bots, when you're doing artificial life forms. Yes. Scary times, 
Scary. There's each one of us trying to go about life. Just believing that we will survive. That's all we can do, really. Because no one knows what's going on out there. A lot of guessing. A lot of theories. A lot of people not obeying. And that's... You know, I've seen things where people got together for poker games that didn't pay attention. They all got sick. Three died. I've seen uh, hospitals where, you know, we've lost over 220 doctors and nurses because they're right in the thick of it, which should tell you, even if they're wearing protective gear, these people died. <laughs> what makes you think you can stand in the open next to somebody that's infected and not get sick? Doctors, nurses, the frontline workers, in close proximity with protective gear get sick. Those without protective gear in the real world, how could you assume that you're not going to come down with something if you put yourself at risk? Don't do that. I won't harp on that because we're not part of drawing, but common sense. I don't want anybody to die that shouldn't die. You know? Don't do it. Don't do it. No. Vivid color, yes. Living color, as they say. I used to be strictly a black and gray guy. And if you look at my website, you'll see I do black and gray. I do full color. I do anything and everything. But right now, the last year or so, I've been just completely absorbed in the sci-fi world. Trying to invent my style that truly feels like my style. And there's things happening that are making it work. But it, it's a time-consuming style, unfortunately. There's no real shortcuts when you have tons of detail. You can make things look like, suggest detail. Like, you know, that's another kind of trick people do. But it's, you know, different ways to make your art look rich. Uh, by rich, what do I mean? I mean, um, full body. You know, like you didn't skimp. Like you really painstakingly got into every nook and cranny and did it. There isn't a stray line on there. Now with digital, you cannot have stray lines because you have to put in every line. You didn't like uh, turn around real fast eating a donut and knock your uh, cup of water over and then try and blot it up and then smear it and then use a Q-tip and something and then go, oh man, that looks freaking awesome. That accident has turned into something beautiful. You don't really get those kind of accidents per se digitally. But you get different accidents that work. That's for sure. See, I can just say, you yeah, know, what does this look like white? What does it look like green? You know, I can cheat a little bit like that. I don't always have to mentally figure it all out like I did airbrush-wise and just painstakingly think. Because if I screw up, I'd have to repaint it. You know, here, you're not worried as much about the repaint as you would be about the time. But you got to be in layers so that you're not destroying other stuff. So when it comes time to self-edit, it's easy to do. So let's save here. I'm going to turn off this layer so you can see what I did. See all that?
So the sacred geometry of horizontal crossing the vertical. Popcorn point to make it a little bit like a highlight edge. And uh, on a flat plane, on a 2D space, you can only have a horizontal and a vertical line intersect. You can't have the third line to create depth of the next dimension. So here, by curving those, I create that dimension. If they were flat and straight, they would steal the depth. So that's a little trick. Purple's a great shadow with orange. Get that rich look. So we're coming back with our shadow. Let's save that. And that's going to be the video. So thanks for tuning in, everybody. Have a great evening. Ciao.